Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? We're starting out our day strong with our Bumblebee song, sped up, of course, to fit the TikTok work, TikTok aesthetic. Welcome, everyone. How are you doing today? Ooh, Fatih John. Hello. Thank you for leaving an emoji. Lovely having you. How are you doing today? Please ignore my cat in the background who is making an absolute mess and making all the sounds, but today's a good day. I am accompanied today by my wonderful friend and awesome interactive engineer, August. Good morning, August. Hey. Good morning, Celine and crowd. I hope everyone's having a fantastic day. To introduce myself, I am Celine, the community manager for Effect House, and welcome to Office Hours. August here is in charge of the project called Microjams. August, would you like to give uh, a sentence <clears throat> explainer about what Microjams is? Yeah, sure. Uh, Microjams is just a way to inspire the community by providing templates and useful tips um, and different sorts of guides to people to teach them things that might uh, generate some new ideas that they might not have thought of before for some fun and interesting interactive effects. Yeah, that's amazing. The latest Microjam project is keyboard. Oh, hi, it's Zeus. Hello, Alejandro. Hello, welcome to the chat. Welcome for joining us. Uh, what was the most recent Microjam program that we announced? Uh, we recently announced the keyboard micro jam and gave a preview on Friday. Uh, that'll be coming out very soon. Uh huh. That looks fantastic. Also, I've been meaning to say your beanie looks very good on you. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone, please let me know if there's anything wrong with this stream, like the voice or if anything you can't hear or if it echoes. But um, I have compiled a couple of our community favorite questions. Uh, while we are waiting for the chat to ask us some questions, I will go ahead and get started on those questions. How do I put my face on a dog? How do you put your face on a dog? Well, let me uh, open a fresh project and we'll uh, take a look. There are a few different ways to put your face on a dog. The first thing you would want to do is bring a dog onto the preview panel so you're able to uh, see what you're doing, unless you have a dog that you can just kind of set on your lap. Uh, and then the next thing you would probably do is go into, um, go into AR tracking and add a head tracker. So for the tracking target for the head tracker, you can select between human and cat. Uh, so you actually can't select a dog yet, uh, I guess. Um, <clears throat> another option is the pet face info. Uh, this will give you a bunch of information about the pet's um, position of the head on the space in 2D space. Uh, so this this could be used almost exactly the same as the head tracker. And if you want to do a dog, I think this will work a little better. Um, for the head tracker for the cat, if you want to put your face on that, that would be a pretty easy um, thing. And I'll just show you really fast. You can, in your assets panel, add a new texture, segmentation texture, head. And that'll give you a a texture that's literally just your head. Um, <clears throat> so that's pretty useful. And then you would maybe create a 3D plane in your tool. And you might put this on the, uh, on the cat's head. And then to make sure that your plane can render the texture, you're going to have to create a, a material that can hold that texture. So this is kind of the middleman that you have to create. And I usually go with unlit when you're trying to render something that is not sort of a, that's more of like an image in front of uh, something else. So anytime you're using a plane, you usually want to use unlit. 
um, and then make sure to turn the texture on and add your head segmentation. So then you have this uh, plane. You don't really need the actual head occluder anymore. And then um, just to see how this works with a cat, uh, let's just have the dog and the cat on the screen. And then you can see that that plane will track. So just make sure that the plane is using the new unlit material that you've created. <laughs> and then, uh, and then as you can see, there's a, there's a black background where the transparent pixels would normally be. And that's because um, by default, the unlit material when you add it uh, is set to a normal blend mode. And the blend mode controls things like transparency or how the pixels interact with the pixels uh, drawn before it. So you would change that to transparent or alpha test, uh, depending on what you're trying to do. And then, uh, and then you could just scale it up. <clears throat> and then, uh, and then <laughs> put it on your pet. Now, obviously, um, this doesn't look like the human's head is really on the pet. So you could go with some more complex options um, to do something crazier. Uh, this is actually fantastic because you've basically taught us how to put a face texture on a screen, but you can use the same principles and basically put it on any 3D surface, right? Yeah, yeah. So you could, if you wanted to put it on a sphere or something, um, yeah, you could put it on anything. That's fantastic. August, I think you also have a little notification that you can hide on the bottom. Oh, yeah. Covering up all of our visual scripting space. <laughs> it's like it's like when you're in the car and you have that friend that never buckles their seatbelt, even though the, <laughs> the seatbelt beep is happening. <laughs> oh. Wait, can you actually show us what it will look like on a cube or a, a sphere? <laughs> sure. Let's uh, let's add it to a cube. Um, so we've already created the material and set it up and everything. So um, so if we just turn off this plane so that we're, we're not confused, mm, the cube is going to look exactly pretty much the same. Um, uh oh. Uh, it should. <clears throat> OK. Uh, so I guess the UV mapping of the cube is different than I thought. But uh, so rather than having the image on every plane, it's like kind of wrapped around the cube. Uh, so <laughs> a sphere actually is probably more interesting. Um, but again, it's going to be. <laughs> oh my god, now she, it looks like you're wearing a goggle, you know, one of those face covering <laughs> goggles that has the person texture on it. But if anyone has seen, I also have a call effect called it's raining cats and dogs. And basically, I'm using my part, I'm following my tutorial on how to create 3D uh, particles. And I'm using this principle that August shared with you right now into each of the particle planes so that all of the, uh, there is like a bunch of cute cat faces and dog faces falling, but it's actually just the image of their head in a plane. So now you know how I created that effect. Hello, hello. More <laughs> people are joining us on the stream. It's Zeus, uh, Luis, Enrique, Tanranga TV, Bruno. Hello, everyone. Welcome. If you have any questions, please leave it in the chat. About Nepal, no, we absolutely do care about Nepal, and um, we will establish a community channel for you right now. Hi, Florentia. Hello, everyone. I have another question. So I, I want to ask you, what is the look at feature? I know that it, it is a new feature for 2.0, but I'm not really sure on how to use it. Yeah, there's a there's a few different I ways. Can't, I'm so sorry, but I can't stop looking at the cat. The face is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> that that face on the cat is like how I look pretty much every day until I get my coffee. 
<laughs> the cat uh, is how I think I would look, and then the uh, the background. No, no, no. The cat is how I actually look, and the back is how I want to look. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. So the look at uh, option. Let's see. Um, so it's a new feature. There's actually mm, quite a few different use cases for it. Uh, and I'll start out with the simplest, which would be, uh, let's see. Let's just create, let's just reuse the plane that we have. Because um, planes uh, work the, well, we'll use this sphere, actually, for now. And we'll switch to the plane. So you, you can add it through um, look at. So you can add it through the 3D menu. So when you add look at, by default, it's um, <clears throat> it's not going to have anything in the target because it doesn't want, know what you want to look at. And the way that you can think about how it's working is um, you can think about whatever you're attaching it to is looking at something. Um, so this sphere, if you see the blue arrow, that is actually the Z forward direction. So that means that this is uh, what this object thinks is the, its front. So this is what it, the direction that it's looking, even though it doesn't really have, um, you know, it's just a sphere. But if we give it an, another object, um, the most common case that I've seen is attaching the camera as the target and keeping the mode on look at point. <clears throat> so as you can see, because um, the sphere UVs aren't like perfectly set up so that that center, it, it's not like the center is the also the center where the texture would be, because uh, that's kind of not really how the UVs are designed. But you can see that no matter how the cat's head moves, that it's like the cheek there. <laughs> uh, is essentially what the center of the sphere is. That's where that Z is. And it's always going to be looking at the camera. That's why I wasn't sure about the sphere, but the plane is probably a better example because we, we know where the center of a plane is, you know? Um, with a sphere, you can't see any edges, so you, it's hard to say. Um, but as you can see um, now, if I take this plane and I go into the rotations and I try to rotate it, it doesn't oh. matter how I, how I rotate it because the uh, look at component is going to be overwriting all of the properties uh, because it's going to force the rotation to be looking at the camera. So this is this is great if you have like a bunch of objects in the scene that you mm -hmm. want to be visible and you don't want them to like rotate too much. Uh, definitely works really well for slam or um, AR world space. Mm -hmm. So when you're when you have like an AR camera and AR plane, you can you can use the look at point or look at uh, component to make sure that things are going to still look at the camera even when the user turns away from them with their phone. Oh, that's a very good tip. So you can you're saying you can also use this in world AR and base right, it right. using the camera. Right, because it's not a screen space effect. It's like a uh -huh. 3D object effect. So when you have that AR camera that can move around in 3D space, uh, it's still just a 3D point in space. It's still a target that you can have another object point towards. Wow, this is so useful. I bet this would be important <clears throat> to all of our gaming developers who are trying to make little games or yeah. people who love doing world AR. Yeah, actually, do you want to see something, a cool use of it that um, this might be kind of inspiring? Uh, let's say, let's continue to use the plane for now. <clears throat> um, and let's do a, well, I know the properties are can set by look at, you know, I haven't tested this, if you can set a position. So let's just do a quick, um, ex well, <laughs> a quick experiment. We don't want it, that to be driven by the head tracker. Um, so this is one way you could do a little quick experiment. Just set the uh, position during start. OK, it goes off screen, so we know that it, we can set the position. We just can't set the rotation because the look at is controlling the rotation. Um, so I like to do little experiments like that when I'm not 100% sure of what's uh, you know happening. 
Um, okay, so, so what we want to do is we know that it's always going to be looking at another object. So let's make it look at a different object like this sphere instead. Um, and the sphere, we're just going to, um, it doesn't need that. And it also can just use a built-in. We'll just give it a new onlet, um, just so you can see the sphere. Um, OK, so the sphere is here. <clears throat> We're going to have the plane always look at the sphere. And this is a different way. See how this plane with the face on it is now like looking down into the sphere? Mm -hmm. Well, well, what we could do is uh, Let's get that transform info. And we now look at this um, node that we have here, world transform info. Very important node if you want, ever want to do anything complex or interesting um, that has like objects interacting with each other. So we could take this transform of the plane um, and we could just plug that in. And now we have all of these different values. So if we uh, add, let's, let's say we'll, um, we're just going to add the current position to the direction, a normalized direction, um, so that the plane is always moving forward. <clears throat> let's, let's do this. Uh, OK, so delta time, this is just a thing you always got to do. You got to take your forward direction. Um, uh, OK, I'll fix this. Uh, I think it'll data convert if I reconnect it, but got so used to doing this. OK, so, so we have this. Um, this forward vector, if we multiply it by the delta time, that's just the time between the last two frames, that'll give us how much distance we should move during this next frame. Um, so that's like a way to say, hey, we're gonna we're moving a little faster because the processing is happening a little faster. Or hey, we're at a really low frame rate, we want to move a little less or, or uh, move a little faster to keep up with how much you know. Um, how much we should move. OK, so and then we have the world position. Uh, and then we want to add this new movement of how much we should move next frame. So now we have the position we would be if we were moving forward a little bit. Um, and then we would also maybe want to multiply some sort of speed value so we control how fast it's going. So right now, our speed is just like 1.0. Um, so then if we connect this to this set, and then we make sure that the update node is making it happen every single frame. Now we have this sphere <laughs> that the head is always chasing. See how it's going towards it and it's oh. looking at it. So if we move it down here, it's going to flip directions, but you can't see it because it's, yeah, there we go. Wow. Oh my God. She's hungry. Um, oh my God. So that's like a cool little way to make objects chase other objects, um, which wow. is really good. If you're thinking about making a game, you might want some enemies that just... Uh, Pac-Man, 3D Pac-Man. Yeah, yeah. Um, 3D Pac-Man with no walls. <laughs> <laughs> that would be scary. I would be scared if those are chasing me. <laughs> we got some questions from the crowd, actually. Florentia asks, Interesting. So if you put a plane with a background, we can attach the look at attach look at attached with the camera. And if people move, the background also moves. Um if people move, the background also moves. I am um, scared because this person keeps coming towards me. <laughs> <laughs> she gone. Um wait, uh can you maybe break that question down a little differently. Um, I'm not sure I understand. Um, are you saying like you would have some objects that track the track the head tracker on the person and like uh, 
we could have some things shift around with the person. Oh, Who's so I think um, she is saying by um, if we have a 3D plane um, mm -hmm. and it's connected to the look at and if you move the device like this, the 3D plane would also tilt in direction like this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So and especially if you're making it um, look at the camera, then it doesn't matter where your camera is pointed. It'll always seem like it's looking at the camera. So, so you can use planes a little more effectively that way to where it won't ever look like they're like sideways, like a 2D element in a 3D space. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Louise also asked, how can I have different index for select number nodes for any of my items that fulfills the function? Um, any of my items that fulfill the function? Um, I'm not exactly sure what to, what that question is asking. Uh, yeah, let me let me clarify the question and then we can get back to it. In okay. the meantime, Musali TV says, "3D chasing device, device to fight off objects." That would be a really <laughs> fun idea. I someone should make that into a game. Maybe Musui <laughs> TV <laughs> will be very looking forward to your event. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, we do have other questions. It's Zeus says, can we use uh, images as 3D objects on an effect? So. Use, can we use images as 3D objects on an effect? Uh, yeah. You can basically anytime you want to use a an image as a 3D object, you'll just put it on a plane. Um, so like we did with the head segmentation, you can do the same thing. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you meant by your question, but uh, yeah, in, so in 2D space, as soon as you attach an image to a canvas or an image object, it'll automatically scale to the image's correct proportions. Since you're since in 3D space, you're just creating a material and attaching a material to a plane, it's not going to auto resize. So you'll kind of have to, uh, you'll kind of have to re, let's just use this, I guess. Um, <clears throat> we'll use this with the default texture. So this checkerboard pattern is just an image. Um, and then if we use that, you can see this plane. Uh, Right now it looks correct, but say say you had like an image that's a little bit taller, you just manually scale the plane, um, and that will change make make it fit into whatever you need. Mm, I should say that pretty much always, if you're doing a two D image on a two D screen, you want to use the canvas with the two D camera, but sometimes there are like hacks or like you know sometimes you want the image to like rotate and like float away or something, and you want to do something clever that's when you might use a plane. Yeah, thank you for answering that. Um, Musili TV also says, building a 3D AR game, is there a way to get overlap of two 3D objects? One being the device with an object stuck onto it, the wand, and then the second being floating 3D object spheres via the back camera. Yeah, that's, uh, let's uh, do that. So AR that sounds tracking. like a really fun concept. Yeah, that's pretty. That's not too hard either. It's a. Uh, it's actually a really uh, common, like, uh, entry level like game development interview question. Ooh. And the the second one that I always fail is where do you get the AR camera? No, I can't find it. <laughs> um, uh, here we'll just interview add. Interview failed. <laughs> <laughs> it, it comes up if you add the AR plane. Um, okay, so um, I think I'll just do that. And then, so this AR camera is the same as the normal camera. So if you add an AR plane with an AR camera and you, everything in your scene is going to be filmed in AR, then just turn off the regular camera because they're all the settings on them are pretty much the same. Um, so you just basically don't want to have two cameras rendering everything. Um, okay, so say that we have this plane that's chasing the sphere, and we we decide, okay, now it's now that we're in AR space and the camera can move. Now we want to switch it to the AR camera. 
So now this like now this face will uh now it's gonna come for you. Um and then we have this sphere as well. So I think the uh I think the plane, let's just reset where it is. And then let's uh Oh, okay. The reason we're not seeing anything is because previously we attached the head segmentation to this plane, remember? Oh, and now the, now, there's no now head. The, now the preview changed, yeah. So um, so for this, I'll just change the texture back to the checkerboard, and you can imagine that it's my face. Um, so uh, one thing to keep in mind, this is a pretty good tip. You can see that the AR camera was added to 000. What I like to do so that these pr scene previews work with objects that are spawned at 000 is I just like to pull them back to where the other camera was. Um, and then <laughs> um, I'm not sure why it's. Oh, I, I think. So I think the thing is. Um, I think the camera, since it's controlled by AR, there's something about um, how it snaps into a different position. So notice how it's, uh, when I move it towards where I think the camera is, it's not quite there. Mm. But but yeah, it's it's around this zero, zero, zero. Um, so it's almost like the camera is over here. Um, anyway. So once you once it's in the 3D world, it doesn't quite matter as much because the user is going to turn as soon as they open it. So you should always position your objects um, in a way that it doesn't matter where they are around the person. Um, and then if you uh, if you wanted to get more clever, you might do something like when the effect starts, you'll you'll snap the object's rotation, the the world rotation to make sure that wherever the user is when they're ready to start the game, it like recenters. Um, that's like a common good practice for stuff like this. But uh, sorry about the flashing. I'll try not to I'll try to reset whenever it gets too close. Uh, but yeah, so this is a setup where it's getting it's cha it's chasing the user basically. So we'll we'll do this thing. Uh, okay, so here's what you would do. Um, you could do, you want to get the position between the objects, basically. So if this object, if you want to see if it's colliding with the camera, you'll take the camp, the plane's position, um, get position, and you'll take the camera's position. And for this, um, the first thing you want to do is you want to find out what's the distance between them, because that's that's the first variable that you need to know. So for that, you'll just um, subtract one minus the other. And it doesn't matter which one you're subtracting, because like you're not getting the direction. You only need to know the distance. Um, so this will give you a vector. Uh, and then uh, usually I'll do distance squared because then you don't have to do a square root and it saves you a little bit of processing power. But for something like this, it doesn't really matter that much. Um, in case you're a game developer and you were just thinking that and you wanted to see if I knew. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now you have the distance. So this is the distance between the objects and then uh, <clears throat> Now you want to know, did they collide? Well, you kind of have to define um, where they would collide. You know, So you have this radius that represents the object. So for this plane, it probably would come out to a little bit in front of the plane. Uh, so let's see. We, would, we might take in a subgraph, actually, for this. Mm. That might make it a little easier so that we can define these variables in the input. Um, and you would have like, you would say like the radius, radius of the object. 
Ah. And then you would also have the radius of the, this would be the radius of the camera, the radius of the user. Um, like, and these are the hitbox of the object and the <laughs> thing, the uh, user. So then what you're gonna do, this is just a kind of a formula, but you wanna, you can use power, you can multiply it together twice, whatever you wanna do. So actually maybe it's more obvious if I just multiply it twice. So you're gonna say uh, this object's radius and you're gonna square it. Um, and then this object's radius and then you're gonna square it. And then you're going to add these together. I think this is right. <clears throat> so you have the, actually, oh no, I'm squaring them because I usually use distance squared, Never mind. Uh, so you just have to add the radiuses together. Sorry. <laughs> um, so then um, that's that's kind of the distance of where the two radiuses intersect, right? So you have like the object coming towards you. It has like a certain radius of what it can be collided with. Then you have your own camera object. And the point, the distance that would cause them to be colliding is anything below this like two radius distance. Anytime that your distance value between the two objects is larger than that, those two radiuses added together, then you're going to basically never be colliding, if that makes sense. Uh, so then you might do like an if statement. Um, so you might say like, um, if this distance is less than those two radiuses, then you are colliding. So really, actually, looking at it with these nodes, it's actually not that complicated looking. Um, but yeah, I think with the math, maybe there's usually a little bit more math with the distance node, where you have to calculate more. Uh, so yeah, this will tell you. We can, If you want, we can watch this value change. Um, this is another thing I really encourage when you're learning. Um, our radius values right now are zero and zero, so it'll basically never collide. But say we have one and one, eventually, <laughs> as the square creeps closer, you can see this is the distance, and this is the distance at which they'll collide because this is oh, the radius. It's the radius. Oh, and it's so, collide. And so once it gets to that point where it's less than the two radiuses, then you'll see the condition here changes, and wow. that's that us programming something that says, hey, they're colliding. And then uh, you can make it using the if node, you can trigger some kind of reaction, like the entire screen turns red, or your HP that you have it set it to a certain number starts decreasing. Yeah, exactly. So mm. with this, you're saying I can make a Minecraft um, attack simulation, where if a someone comes too close to me, then I will start losing HP. Yeah, exactly. Very um, scary. In the past, I made an effect I never released where um, you can walk around a Minecraft world in 3D space and jump and stuff. And uh, and sm the bigger you smile, the faster you run. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that is uh, hilarious. We would love yeah, to see that effect. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll bring it back out of storage and see if I can think of something a good Mostly reason. TV to release. says nice thanks. I think he's very happy about this little tutorial. We have yeah. more questions from Bruno. <laughs> it says, "Hi August, is it possible to use the device rotation data of the user's cell phone in some effect? For example." I set up a scene, and if it turns 180 degrees and encounters an object, it scores a point. Yes. Uh, actually, maybe I'll show off a demo as long as um, I think it's OK to show off this demo. It's a personal project I made, but I trust that nobody will copy it too closely. <laughs> um, let's see. 
Rusalay TV says making a lightsaber game where you hit floating enemies in like in episode <laughs> six. That would be amazing. Um, okay. Let me just make sure I have it. Okay, here it is. Now, this is uh, this is an interesting thing. I won't spend too much time going through the whole thing, but I, I think it could show um, some things that you could do in AR space. Um, so for this project, I have a I just modeled a pretty simple coffee mug, and then I modeled a, just kind of a circular plane for the coffee that's inside of it. And it's kind of hard to see with these AR previews. I I, I almost want to make my own AR preview that like tilts the camera forward um, more so you can see the effect more. But essentially, I have the coffee cup attached to the camera. And then this uh, circular plane is staying surf level with the world. So as you tilt the cup, it looks like the coffee is staying you know down in the cup with gravity. Um, and there's some other things I want to continue working on this with. I wanted to um, add, some, add a blend shape to this circle so that the edges of it kind of like wrinkle up when it moves and, and take into account some inertia of where the how the 3D plane was rotated before. And, and there's all these little polished details that you can spend way too much time on and make it kind of look pretty realistic. Um, and you, I, I think the, I haven't seen too many demos where it's kind of like almost realistic simulated physics uh, as close as you can get without, you know, writing a shader or something. Um, this but yeah, is this super is... awesome. Haley I, I was kind of. Oh, Haley Cat uh... says the steam looks so cool. <laughs> yeah, I went to. Um, I think I just got them off of Adobe's free brushes, and I just painted one steam cloud, and then I have this set up down here where um, each of them kind of just. Well, okay. I didn't prepare this for a demo, so it looks a little spiderwebby. But uh, <laughs> essentially, I'm lurping them between being small, making them rotate. Basically, same thing you would do with a bunch of transit by time nodes. Um, and then just, as you can see here, I'm using this counter that loops. And then I'm just telling each of them to spawn. And they spawn in world space. So when you're testing Ooh. this on, mo on mobile, you'll move the phone around and you'll see a steam trail left in, in space. That's so cool. Yeah, thank you. Lerp is actually my favorite node and I feel like more people, I want more people to use the Lerp node because it, it increases the quality of your effects immensely. So for those of you who don't know, Lerp is a node that allows you to smoothly move things. Um, would you like to provide a more technical definition of <laughs> Lerp, August? Um, so yeah. Instead of usually, if you if you weren't using a lerp node, you might just snap an object on or off, um, or like you would say it was in this position. Now it's just going to be in this position. Lerp is a way to say like, okay, we know where it's going to start. We know where it's going to end. Um, if we have a value that from zero to one that represents how far along between those positions we are, we could create like a transition. So so say that you're you're starting over on the left side of the screen and you're, you want to end on the right side of the screen, well, you'll have the, that zero to one value that says how far in between those positions are we. So at 0.5, it'll be right in the center of the screen. So it's a way to control more comp, and it's great for complex values like a vector three, because then you're doing this one lerp with uh, three separate values at the same time. It saves you some space in the visual scripting graph. Mm -hmm. Bruno says lerp heart emoji. He also says, thanks, August. <laughs> Laurentia says, yes, this could be the future of particles. I agree. Uh, moving on to question from Haley Cat. She uh, said, is it possible to look, is it possible to use the look at component with the body avatar drive? Ooh. Um, let's see. Okay. So actually, let's open the um, template. Um, new from template body character character drive. I think this one is. Uh, I'm not sure uh, about character drive. August is going to demo that right now. But if you use like a 3D dancing avatar and make them all look at you, 
then it can you can create your own little dancing cult around yourself. Yeah. So the thing that you need to understand with uh, Body Avatar Drive is it's going to have its own uh, it's going to have its own rotation. So the user has their whole body rotated in a certain direction. So if you turned 90 degrees, your character is also going to turn 90 degrees. So if you can if you can think about that, um, then then you you know that'll help you understand why it's a certain rotation at a certain time, and it'll understand it'll help you understand where to put that object. So right now, body avatar drive is controlling the uh, I think the skeleton and render root. Uh, maybe that maybe the avatar alien, but. It may just be starting on the hips. Um, so it might not be controlling this object, this object, or this object. So any of those, I think, would be OK for adding a look at. Um, so if we wanted to test it, we might use the camera, I guess. Um, so now it's going to. Oh, the skeleton and render root is always going to be looking at the camera. That doesn't necessarily oh. mean that the, that the character will, but that will change its kind of offset. Um, and since it's animated, it's a little hard to tell. That's why it might be better to add a new object, like a little cube, and make, uh, make it follow that so we can control. I always love doing experiments where you have more control um, because that way you can just like find out more info and then you can go back to the actual design. Uh, so as you can see, the character is not really looking at the rotating with the cube. That leads me to believe that, um, that this skeleton and render root rotation is being controlled by body avatar drive along with the hips and the rest of the skeleton. So in that case, we would remove this. We would do another investigation um, here. And we might set this to cube and just see how that operates. Oh, he moved. Oh. Um, so the fact that he moved, um, since we're rotating this object, we have to consider how the offset position is. And as you can see, the offset of the skeleton and render root has some um, non-zero values. So it's not going to rotate around the pivot. <laughs> it's hard. OK, so I guess the skeleton and render root is also driven by that. Um, OK, this is a tricky thing that you might uh, might not immediately know how to solve, but I can show you how. Um, so if you have an offset that is being hard coded by a feature or by some other script that you've written, uh, you can still rotate. You can still set the pivot back to that center by having an offset parent. Um, so I don't know if this one's being driven, but we'll set this to 0. OK, that's fine. So see, this has this hard-coded value here. Well, if you want to put the pivot back to center, if you want to match the centers, you'll just put the opposite here. So that one was negative 12. We're going to put it back to 12 here. And then, as you can see in the scene here, uh, it should be centered. So I guess the hips are also not centered. OK, so that's the hips. That's the skeleton render root. OK. So I think um, <clears throat> I think when we rotate this object now, it'll at least rotate around its own point. OK. So that is correct. Um, and then we have the body avatar drive. Um, and I think this is just how you would place it, the top level object. Um, and then, as you can see, it's not looking at the cube. Um, or maybe it is, but maybe not the, not the forward of the alien, since it has other rotations being applied. Uh, so one thing we can try is we can try just ro 
rotating it and it looks like <laughs> it, keep, it keeps kind of snapping to look another direction. Um, and I am not 100% sure if that's because, um, yeah, let's just remove this. And yeah, so you'd have to um, have to make sure to sort of zero everything out and then Okay, so the, the fact that he's uh, rotating around his perfect center here uh, makes that a pretty good candidate for using the look at on this object. We're so then, troubleshooting real time with you guys. <laughs> yeah, it's just that there's a lot of, um, whenever you find a new use case for an old feature um, that you haven't done before, uh, it's good to start out in an experimental phase where you're testing things. Uh, you don't just want to jump in and think that you know how to do it exactly. But now we can see that the alien will always rotate towards the cube. Um, so if you wanted to put it in 3D space, um, the probably the best way is to make sure that your character is aligned with your blue arrow, your Z forward, and then you'll add the look at um, and attach it to your AR camera. Um, and then, or yeah, if, if you're doing it in 3D space, I guess, if you want the character to always be looking at the camera. But as well, yeah, you can make them look at anything you want now. You just have to make sure that you don't put it on an object that's being controlled by another feature, and also that's not like offset in a weird way from the object's pivot. Um, I hope that was helpful. Thanks for sitting there and uh, debugging <laughs> with me. Haley Cat says, thank you so much for this. And she even said two cat heart eye emojis. Florentia <laughs> says, amazing. Uh, we hmm. have another question from Lin Trung. They're asking, hi, what is an easy effect I can make with my kids? Oh. Ooh. I... I like to start with templates when I'm making something easy because part of the project is already done and you just have to come up with some assets. Uh, so if I were to do an easy one with my kids, I might try Randomizer 2D. <laughs> Not that I'm tied or associated to it in any way. <laughs> uh, yeah, this is a great one because um, as you can see, you have uh, you do have a visual scripting panel, but you don't really need to ever look at it. You can leave it totally as is. You can totally just close that, and um, and your entire effect is basically just importing a PNG sequence. Mm. Um, so the only things you have to really think about with this is what do I want to randomize, um, and then you have to create in in some you know art software like Photoshop or Procreate or something, just a series of things. And then you go here and you just say import texture sequence and you just select uh, all of your objects that are going to be randomized. And then you just go to the randomize and you just swap the texture sequence right here. And then you probably also want to have a title, but if you don't want a title, you just turn the title off and then your randomizer is done. Um, so it's like an, a simple one where you can focus on the art assets and the idea, and you don't really have to fidget much with how do I make it. So it's a really good intro one to just, I, I think there's a huge uh, benefit to being able to launch something. So having something that's so easy that you can just click submit and then you can see your effect on TikTok and it gives mm. you this boost of like confidence. Yeah. Like, oh, it really is that easy. Yeah. So that's that's why I love this one because it's, you know, it starts out just creating some 2D images and, and then you're done. Some great tip for beginners. Um, I know it is easy to get sucked into like all of the tutorials and videos and get intimidated. But I feel like what's most important is that you publish something like you can get better with each project. So I suggest you try out like one of their templates, maybe 2D, like August 
2D randomizer like August suggested. And after you publish your first one, you will gain like a boost in confidence and then you can go try out harder projects as well. So in this case, I would break it down into two main things for you, Lin Chang. Um, number one is deciding, hey, what do I want to randomize? Like, so come up with a question together. Like, it can be an interactive thing. And then you can write down a list of 10 objects. And then number two, you can try to create assets, which are basically just photographs or drawings that you want to use as the individual options. For example, it can be number of 10 different kind of animals. So then you can you will write down like a list of 10 animals like elephant, giraffe, and then for each of one, you can either try to find a photo or you can download a photo or you can even draw it on paper and take a photograph of the drawing. And then you can put it to Effect House. I also have a really good recommendation that I think will be super funny, which is the 2D sticker. Um, August, do you mind showing the 2D sticker like on screen? Oh, sure. Um, so both of these are actually 2D stickers. But if you want to create one, you would you would go to face effects and click face sticker. Yeah, um, and basically, um, if you change the, it, as you can see, if you do a close up, uh, you see that there's something <clears throat> sticking to her face, right? So you can just get the background image, which is the photo of this person's face, and then draw whatever you want on the face. For example, it can be like cat whiskers, or you can draw like devil horns, or you can make your eyes look like panda. So it feels like you're actually like scribbling on the face. And I, and I think it's so funny. Sometimes I just like draw a fake mustache or draw a little scar, and then immediately you, you're you able to see it on like everyone's face. And I just think that is like super, super funny. So those are my recommendations for you. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, um, one, one piece of advice that I have um, when you're using this um, face sticker, uh, I, I would say this isn't really meant for doing like makeup where you have like specific objects on exactly specific places. But if you take a look when I'm moving it over the mouth, for instance, um, on the preview panel over here, it kind of snaps sometimes between places. And that's because the object itself is going to be actually choosing whichever of these face points is closest to the center or the pivot. And it's going to be snapping the pivot onto there. And then uh, it'll do some minor adjustments here and there to like shift it around but but you basically have to have this pivot point close to any of these. So let me just show you, if you put it way up here, the pivot point is actually going to be uh, really <laughs> a really high value. Uh, but sometimes to create an offset, I'll set my pivot somewhere, and then I'll move my object wherever I want. And I'll know that that object is always going to be pivoted or pinned to this face point. So even if I have it over by the ear, if I want it to be attached to the uh, left side of the head, I'll put my pivot over there. And then I'll know that it's kind of like following that. It's like pinned to that. You can think of a little metal pin going from there to there, holding it in place. So that's, a, that's one tip if you want to do things like stickers on the face and stuff like that. Yeah. I hope this was helpful. I can't wait to see what you create with your kids. Please let us know if you do create. You can tag us on the Discord channel and then say, hey, I was the person who asked the questions. Here are <laughs> our effects. Anyone from today's chat, like, please say, hey, I was at office hours and we talked about this and then I created an effect. We would love to see it. Uh, I think we addressed all of the questions from the chat. If you have any more questions, please leave it in the chat. Um, I wanted to point out like a fun 2.0 feature that in case you haven't tried it out, the GAN nodes. These are new, right? Yeah, let's take a look. Uh, GAN stands for uh, GAN. <laughs> Generative <laughs> Adversarial Networks. I know that. Yeah, <laughs> Gen Generative Adversarial Networks. Uh, yeah, so these are just like uh, these weird AI style effects. So we'll do smile, for instance. Now, this isn't just like an image of a smile that's pasted onto people's faces. 
there's a there's a tiny AI algorithm that's running that's that's basically mm, it's basically taking in uh, our model here, Jeff Rain's face, and it's saying, uh, what would a, what would teeth look like on him based on its little generative adversarial network? So, um, so that's why it looks so real because it's not just pasting one image; it's figuring out what teeth would look like on him as best it can, and you know, it's uh, it'll be better depending on how how that algorithm was created. Um, and so, yeah, you can see how it looks on him. He's, he looks kind of funny. I think this is how it looks on people with beards. So try out all of the GAN effects, figure out which one you like the most and make sure to test them on all of the different models. So you'll kind of know ahead of time what they're going to look like on, you know, different looking people. My favorite is the pucker. Can you show the pucker one? Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. show the pucker. I was, um, I loved, <laughs> I loved how this, um, how people have been using this pucker. I've seen people making it look like the character is drinking a drink. Eating or like, a spaghetti. <laughs> yeah. So many Posing like funny for effects. for the kiss fam. I didn't, I really didn't expect, uh, people to get that creative with it. I didn't, I didn't think of those things, so. So yeah, I love to see people using the, these new features and uh, also eyebrow eraser. This is a big one. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, it erases the eyebrow so that you can create a, a beauty effect that doesn't have eyebrows or you can make your own eyebrows. And that seems or to be Or you can like... be Voldemort, Lord Voldemort. Exactly. Haley Kat pretty... says, is there a way to extract the generated facial features, like duplicate them? um you mean like with face inset or something like that uh well uh we'll see let's see curious now i haven't tried to do that so right eyebrow uh that looks like an eyebrow to me that doesn't look like a bald spot Input texture. Okay, here, here's where you got it. Um, so we do have a solution. Um, let's delete all of the things that we're not using. So, so they kind of simplify what we're dealing with. Um, <laughs> we'll delete the whole randomizer because why not? Um, so what we've got here is a GAN effect, which is creating this eyebrow eraser. So so this is um, this is outputting to the final render output. I so in my own experiences, I never use the final render output for anything other than rendering it to the screen. So if I'm ever going to do anything with whatever the camera is outputting, I'll create a render texture, which I just created in the assets panel below, and now I'm selecting it in the camera. So that means that we're not putting it to the final output. So you won't see what the GAN is doing. It's stashing it temporarily in this render texture. So, in, so this preview window is basically what you'll see in final render output. Uh, that's what the final, the last thing that gets rendered basically and show, it gets shown to the user. So instead of putting it there, we put it there. And then in face inset, this camera input texture. Oh, OK. I see. This is a newer feature, I think. But uh, the final render output is actually being used for that. And so scrap what I said about creating a render texture. We'll just see if this works. OK, and there you go. It works. Ooh. So thanks to our wonderful engineers and RDs who have created the face inset tool, they've actually made a very easy way to say, hey, whatever you've done to the eyebrows or mouth or eyes, let's just use the font. The, already in process final render out. Um, and since we have it, and, and this is a interesting and important point, notice that they're in two different render groups. Um, so the output of this render group, since it's up physically above the other one, the output of this is already going to be, that final render out is going to be ready. So you can use it in this one. Um, so that keep, creates the separation that I think is important to make this like kind of a value that you'll you'll know that that gigan effect is already 
completed. So if you wanted to use the pucker and just get your lips and put it everywhere so it looks like you're getting lots and lots of kisses, <laughs> you could do that. Let's see how it looks. Let's see how it looks. Uh, Haley Kett uh, says, yay, thank you. Bruno says, yeah. we need a bald too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it doesn't. It's confused. Maybe the, I wonder if it has to do with the beard, but it's, it's a little confused. Okay. Oh, okay. So what might be happening here is it might be um, using oh, the area, the, ori the original position of the mouth mm -hmm. and stuff, and cutting out, cutting it out from the new texture. Mm. Um, so it's not. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's going to be perfect. But for the eyebrows, they don't move at all, so it'll work perfectly fine for the eyebrows. But uh, but yeah, unfortunately, I think the the mouth you might be able to do something here, uh, but I don't think it's gonna be perfect. Um, yeah, but it's kind of a crazy weird case. But uh, if you find any way to kind of like push it in the right direction, we'd love to see what you come up with. Mm -hmm. Florencia says yes, I work in bald head but it's not too good so he's, i think she's saying she's working on the bald effect oh nice i think <clears throat> we are at time for today thank you so much for everyone for coming it was truly lovely having all of you and communicating with you mike i know you just sent a question but unfortunately we are out of time for today however i will write this question down so on our next office hours, which will be next week at the same time, we will try to address this question. <clears throat> Writing it down yeah. right now. And I just want to say I really love answering questions and helping people find solutions to just like different complex things. So just make sure that if you enjoyed the office hours, you share the praises of how it helped you <laughs> and, you know, uh, let us know um, whether it was useful to you and stuff and i'd love to keep doing it in the future <laughs> yeah and if you ever create an effect um like the wand effect um that we worked on today please let us know in the discord channel so we can see your work and then we can praise it together say yay you did it we would love to you know bruno says thank you selena and august thank you you guys oh everybody's saying thank you oh love <laughs> love this help Okay, it was lovely talking to you guys. I will again end with my Bumblebee song because I have been obsessed with this song. But <laughs> I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Have an amazing Monday. Bye, Tay Tay. Bye, Florentia. Bye, Lynn. Bye, Bruno.